or they can watch it. Just, just FYI, uh, we are recording this presentation for future generations to enjoy. Hello, future <laughs> generations. And hello, Maggie Case. She is interim executive director. Congratulations. Thank and you. former curator, uh, but still with the Southwest Seattle Historical Society, located at the Log House Museum, um, which uh, when they reopen, they have promised, and by they, I mean Maggie Case, has promised a tour. Uh, normally, it's open to the public Friday through Sunday, uh, 12 to 4. It will be reopening in April. So uh, she came over from the Gates Foundation Discovery Center, where they still speak well of her over there. David was like, oh, I love Maggie Case. Uh, she earned her master's at UW in museum studies, moved to Washington four years ago from North Adams, Massachusetts, which is close to where my sister lives, uh, where she <laughs> trained at Mass MoCA uh, and the Clark, both places I've been. Um, I don't know why I inserted those things, and now they're recorded. So <laughs> every, everyone can Tell me. Downhill. I'm so sorry, Maggie Case, for that awful introduction, but thank you for being here, and uh, thank you for doing this presentation on Seattle history. It's some really unique things, so thank you. Thank you. That was a wonderful introduction. I don't know what you're talking about, and it just speaks to the lovely relationship that we've built over the past year together. Um, hello, everybody. As Alan said, I'm Maggie Case. I'm the Interim Executive Director of the Southwest Seattle Historical Society, and I'm really happy to be here today. I'm going to give you a little behind the scenes of our latest exhibit, Spear Returns 2.0, A Duwamish and Settler's Story. <laughs> this is a dual hosted exhibit between ourselves and the Duwamish Longhouse and Cultural Center, and it's actually been in the works since 2019, and I've been leading the initiative since November of 2020. So it's been a really long time in the making. It just opened in October, and we are all really happy with how it turned out. So uh, I hope that you all enjoyed this little sneak peek of a presentation today. There's plenty more to see at the museum. I can really only scratch the surface here, uh, but I think we're going to have a lot of fun today. Thank you for being here. Do you have a May question? I, I, so, but you're not going to be open till April, is that right? You're closed now? Yeah, we're closed right now. So we're reopening in April. Okay. And for those of you who don't know, just a little bit about the Southwest Seattle Historical Society, we promote local heritage through education, preservation, and advocacy. We serve the Duwamish Peninsula specifically, which we consider to be White Sienna, White Sienna, White Center, South Park, and West Seattle. You can tell it's late on a Friday, my friends. My apologies for that. Um, and of course, we run the Log House Museum for our physical location. So we're excited to see you all in April. Alan uh -huh. gave you a sense of who I am, where I came from, what I do. But the one thing I did want to point out actually is that my background is not in history um, specifically or explicitly. My undergraduate degrees are actually in arts management, which is how I ended up in museums and English literature. And my focus in literature was in 19th century works. I was specifically interested in the romantics. I wrote a really, really long paper about William Blake, which was a wild ride. Um, but I point that out because I think it gives my interpretation of history kind of a unique point of view. Um, I often come at primary resources from uh, a sort of detached place, I think, because I was trained to deal with uh, primary source documents sort of divorced from the speaker at first to really just say, what is this piece of information trying to tell me? And then later add back in biographical details about the speaker. And that's going to come up quite a bit later because one of the main um, impetuses for us at the Southwest Seattle Historical Society to revisit this exhibit was because a group of letters were donated to us written by David S. Maynard. Maynard was one of the very, very first settlers, non-native settlers here in the Seattle area. So it was super cool and super interesting to get to do so much work um, with documents of his that no one had ever seen before. So I'm gonna give you all sort of a sense of what we're doing today. The first is that we're gonna talk high level. What is the Spirit Returns exhibit? The second thing we're going to do is dive a little bit into what the creative process looks like behind creating ex an exhibit um, and talk a little bit about the partnership we had with ourselves and the Duwamish Longhouse and Cultural Center. 
The third thing we're going to do is talk a little bit about what happened in the 1850s when non-native settlers arrived in Elliott Bay and permanently settled here. The fourth thing we're going to do is talk about those primary and secondary resources and research. And then the last part is we're going to get really into the nuts and bolts. What does it take to build an exhibit together? So reinventing and reimagining an exhibit that occurred 20 years ago was actually a really, really exciting opportunity for me, as well as a pretty big challenge. This kind of reinterpretation isn't actually something that happens super often in museums. Um, and two of the biggest items that I actually had to figure out while I was thinking about the concept for this exhibit was how do I update this story 20 years later and how do I differentiate it from the first exhibit? So a little bit of context on the first Spirit Returns is here. The first Spirit Returns exhibit actually opened on Founders Day in November 2000 at the Log House Museum. At the time, that exhibit was curated by B.J. Bullard, who is a longtime supporter of the Duwamish tribe's sovereignty rights and a producer of numerous documentaries about the tribe. Um, but that exhibit only went up at the Log House Museum. One of the things that made it really, really unique actually was the fact that it was the first time that the Duwamish people's story had been told to the public in a public setting, which was a really wonderful experience. And then additionally, on top of that, um, it had a lot of direct relationships with objects that were donated and loaned by Duwamish people themselves. So even though it was sort of based specifically at the Log House Museum, even in 2000, there was a lot of back and forth between these two organizations to make sure that the story was being told right. So uh, what we had to think about first was, how are we really gonna differentiate this? So one of the ways that we, that we were able to think about that was of course, multiple locations. In 2012, the Duwamish Longhouse and Cultural Center opened. Um, I don't know how many times I'm going to say that organi organization name today, but it's going to be a lot, I think. So at the Log House Museum, we are specifically telling the story of the early settlers, and it's really focused on their relationships with each other, their relationships with the land, and of course, their relationships and their perception of the Duwamish people. And then at the Cultural Center, they're telling their own story in their own space with their own artifacts for the first time, which is really, really exciting and a huge difference from that first exhibit where everything was based in one location. I would say as well, another difference is that there's much more focused themes and an overall smaller scope. The first exhibit really told a huge breadth of history. It was really, really comprehensive, um, talking from multiple different perspectives from multiple different families about that early relationship in the 1850s. We took a much, much more focused approach, which we'll get into more a little bit later. Additionally, we've got updated interpretation and new research. A lot of what I was trying to do at the Log House Museum was really question um, settler culture and what a lot of us have been taught about some of these early settlers. Do they deserve to be on the pedestals they often find themselves? As we were talking uh, with each other earlier before the presentation started, do they deserve to be the people who have their names all over Seattle? Things like that. So I really wanted to start a dialogue there and kind of question a lot of what um, dominant culture assumes and takes for granted about how settlers came to this area. Right. And then last but not least, we wanted it to be a celebration of community collaboration. Um, the Duwamish Longhouse really felt strongly that there is so much work and change that's been done in the past 20 years since this first exhibit opened that they really wanted to take a moment and celebrate the fact that they're still here, they're still thriving, they're still surviving, um, and that the friendship that's really uh, developed between ourselves and them had, was kind of a large part of that story. So the last part of our exhibit is really just a celebration of the last 20 years, but then also, of course, a call to action for non-Native people because the Duwamish are still seeking justice today. So let's talk a little bit about that reinterpretation of history angle, because this is what I spent most of my time doing while I was curating this exhibit. So um, it really took me a while to ask the question of what interpretive angle are we going to take here? 
And then also given all of that primary source research that was available to me, I decided that maybe the answer was really to zoom in on those first few families that arrived here. And then, like we've already mentioned, you know, I was questioning sometimes even just the very specific words that we were using, things like pioneer and what that connotates in 2021. How could we examine this history through a new lens of equity in this exhibit? Those two threads really came together to think about the individual impacts that people like Arthur Denny and Doc Maynard had on our history, the good, the bad, and frankly, the ugly. What was a city builder really? Did anybody come here with the express intention to create a city? What were those early settler relationships like with each other, with the Duwamish? Those were some of the questions that I was really wrestling with throughout this process of curating the exhibit. Of course, though, updated interpretation couldn't just come from me or from the Log House Museum. While creating these two exhibits, Heidi Bohan, the curator of the Longhouse's half of the exhibit, and I spent a really long time trying to actively merge our stories together and really think about what we were saying collectively. Um, what were the interpretive touch points? What were we both trying to do together? So a lot of what we came up with was, again, you know, this uplifting celebratory tone that we wanted to leave everybody with. We have the Maynard letters as a connecting piece. There's a Maynard letter on display at the Log House Museum, as well as at the Long House and Cultural Center. And then we really pushed back against terminology like pre-contact, post-contact, party, first contact. And reconsidering that terminology doesn't necessarily mean that it was eliminated entirely from our exhibit or from our lexicon. For example, the phrase party, I'm probably going to use about a million times today while describing those first settlers who arrived here. But we really wanted to think about what those connotations were for those words, um, how they were potentially shaping the way we talk about and think about history in a certain way. We spent a long time specifically, especially talking about first contact and the fact that that idea is sort of a myth. It's impossible to really talk about who of the Euro-American settlers had the very, very, very first contact with Indigenous people in this land, especially when we're talking about all the way to the West, um, when Euro-Americans had been here for centuries before they had actually settled and colonized this area specifically. And then on top of all of this, we had the very logistical consideration that we are both in very, very small spaces. On the right here, you can see a photo of the Log House Museum while it was still a private re residence, which is always really, really interesting. Um, initially, Spirit Returns 2.0 was actually only going to be in one gallery at the Log House Museum, but it became clear very, very quickly that our story needed the entire floor plan to be told in a historically responsible manner. A lot of what I had to think about here was how do you take a huge swath of history, we're covering almost a decade here in the 1850s, and make it bite-sized and digestible while also still telling the truth of the story. As I've mentioned before, one of the ways that we really combated this problem um, was narrowing the scope and zooming in on those key players. So we decided to really focus in on those on four key settler families who first arrived here between 1851 in 1852. The Denny's, the Maynard's, the Borens, and the Lowe's. And we were really thinking about what motivated them. Why did they even come west to begin with? And then what drew them to the greater Seattle area? And then most importantly, what were the consequences of their specific arrival here? It's not going to be possible, unfortunately, for me to take you through every single aspect of this exhibit today. So I'm gonna give you all an overview of what the exhibit entails specifically, and then we'll dive a little bit into that research process and some of what I learned. So there are three parts to the historical society's aspect of this exhibit. The first section really deals with that 1850s time period, and that's mostly what we're going to be talking about today, exploring the early settlers. The second part of the exhibit is oral histories that we collected in 2020 and 2021 interviewing key people in um, the West Seattle and Duwamish Peninsula community, asking them questions about how this history affects them in their day-to-day -day lives. Do they think about it often? Does it affect how they interact with their current community in the land? That's really, really what we wanted to explore there. And then lastly, of course, the third part of this exhibit is that celebratory aspect, um, which was really a joy to curate. 
Of course, we're focusing today mostly on the first part of the exhibit, but before we do, I wanted to share this quote from the oral history we collected from Jolene Haas, who's the director of the Duwamish Longhouse and Cultural Center, and additionally, the daughter of Cecile Hansen, who is, of course, the honorable chairwoman of the Duwamish tribe. And I wanted to share this because to me, this quote really encapsulates why exhibits like Spirit Returns 2.0 matter, why constantly interpreting, reinterpreting, and questioning history is so important, and why, of course, our history is always informing our contemporary moment. So I'm going to take just a second to read this out loud. She says, what would I want them to know? That, well, my mom always says it, and I feel like it's a really simplified thing but you cannot take our identity away. We are who we are, I can't even explain it. Um, and then she goes on to say, it's almost like I have an army of my ancestors behind me saying, this is the right thing to do. We are sovereign, we signed the treaty with the president of the United States. We gave up so much that we cannot be forgotten and that our right, we should continue to fight that wrong and injustice that happened to our tribe because we've given up so much. A lot of our leaders have died. A lot of our people now don't even know who they are. They are going through the journey. So of course, while many and potentially a more dominant settler culture might be able to say the answers to their questions of how this history informs their everyday lives, it might not be that much. For people like Jolene and the Duwamish, it's informing everything that they do today, especially because the Treaty of Point Elliot isn't currently being upheld. So as we've discussed, this all started with a key group of settlers here who are on the screen. Uh, as you can see, on the left, we've got an image of the entire Lowe family. Uh, to the right of them, we've got Arthur Denny, the man, the myth, the legend. To the right of that is Doc Maynard. And then lastly on our screen here is Carson Boren. So as we've discussed, this group of settlers known as the Denny Party arrived on Alki Point on November 13th, 1851. The Denny family, the Lowe family, and the Boren family specifically made up this party, which was led by Arthur Denny. They all traveled from the Midwest and made contact with local indigenous nations for the first time with the intent to settle this area and create a big city. Or at least all of that is how the story often goes. In actuality, though, non-native Euro-American people have been in contact with local indig indigenous nations in Washington and along the Puget Sound region since the 18th century. The whole idea of first contact is largely a myth, especially the idea that the Denny party specifically would have been the first settlers in contact with the Duwamish people. Trade routes, <coughs> excuse me, Trade routes and communication with the Duwamish and other indigenous nations were in place decades and decades before the landing party arrived in Alki Point. And then additionally, when the landing party containing most of the Denny, Lowe, and Boren families actually arrived, they had already begun construction on their settlements. A member of the Den Denny family named David and two brothers, Charles and Lee Terry, were actually already here claiming land very illegally, I might add, and building structures for everyone to live in on Alki. And you'll notice as well there that as I was talking, I switched it up and used the word landing party instead of Denny party as well. Arthur Denny is very often styled as being the leader of the settler families in Seattle. And I suppose in some ways that's true, especially as time went on. But in actuality, Arthur Denny and Carson Boren and their families joined up with John Lowe's party on the journey west. And it's John Lowe who led them all to Oregon, which is where they had all intended to settle initially in the Willamette Valley. Um, it wasn't Arthur Denny who was necessarily in charge of that journey. So the Denny family, the Lowe family, and the Boren family, all three of them, lived in Alki actually only for a very, very short time before they realized that the land that they really wanted to live on was what is now in downtown Seattle and in Pioneer Square. Um, the Denny family and the Boren family actually moved really, really quickly. They set up shop, they were creating markets and setting up mail, and generally speaking, kind of situating... <coughs> Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry, everybody. Um, situating their society and cultural values in the area. The Lowe family specifically decided to stick it out on Alki for a little while, thinking that they, they would be able to create 
a really great farmland over there. Um, and at the time for all of them, their goals were really to own land and make money, which at the time in the Midwest was two extremely difficult goals to achieve. So this was largely what motivated them all to move west to begin with. Having said that, they weren't really here to build a city per se. They just wanted to own their own land, move their families here, and be able to set them up for success. As a bit of a side note, on the screen right now, you're specifically seeing Lydia Lowe, John Lowe's wife. Lydia is often thought of as being the loneliest woman in Seattle. Because after the Denny and Boren families moved off of the peninsula, Lydia was the only white woman in Alki. Of course, there were many, many indigenous women who lived in the area. This title alone, I think, kind of shows an outdated uh, interpretation of history. But I do think it speaks a lot to experiences that white women had when they were moving west, being isolated from their family, friends, and the life that they've always known. Um, and of course, getting on and off the peninsula then is was no easier than it is today, especially without the West Seattle Bridge. So I thought I'd throw that little aside out there. Having said all of this, though, there was another settler family that was a little bit more concerned with the idea of city building, or at least that's often how we think about them today. In March of 1952, David S. Maynard and his wife arrived in the Seattle area from Olympia, and he went to work setting up his physician's practice, as well as a general store and pharmacy for the settlers in the area. David Doc Maynard also worked really closely with Chief Seelf, the leader of the Duwamish and Suquamish tribes at the time, to negotiate relationships with the settlers and the indigenous peoples who lived here. Doc Maynard is often talked about as being a really, really great friend to Indigenous peoples today, especially Chief Seal or Chief Seattle. But as we'll see in the moment, the truth is actually a lot more complicated than that. Maynard is the person who convinced the settlers to name this area after Chief Seal. But he also had a huge hand in creating the Treaty of Point Elliot, which ultimately, officially, and quote unquote legally, stole the land of the native peoples in this area, and he also played a really big role in turning the tides of the Battle of Seattle towards the settlers. There are so many other families and people and relationships that we could touch on when we talk about the settling of Seattle that for this we had to narrow the focus. I mean, even to get us started talking about the history today, right here in this moment, I had to really, really focus just on those first years, very high level, who arrived, what were they up to, what did they want? So the exhibit itself dives deeply into a lot of the concepts that we touched on really briefly here as we set the stage in 1851 and 1852 for non-native Euro-Americans to arrive in the Seattle area perfectly, uh, permanently. We talk a little bit more as well about the Treaty of Point Elliot and discuss the role of territorial governor of Washington, Isaac Stevens, and the role he plays in colonizing this area and ultimately displacing thousands upon thousands of indigenous people from their ancestral homes, and much worse than just displacing as well. I will say though, with this kind of large overview, you've heard me do a few things. The first, of course, is give you that really high level overview of who our key players are and what their role was in the early 1850s when there were only really a few dozen settlers in the area. But the second thing you've heard me do, hopefully, is actively question and reinterpret that dominant narrative regarding who those settlers were, what their roles in building a city were, and what their relationships with the Duwamish people were. I was largely able to do a lot of that questioning and pushing back through some of this primary and secondary research that I was doing while curating the exhibit. So we're going to dive a little bit into that now and talk about how what I found really changed my personal perception of Seattle's history. So as I mentioned at the beginning of 2020, the Historical Society was really honored to be chosen as the recipient of dozens and dozens of David S. Maynard's letters by his descendants and his current living family. These letters had never been seen by historians before, and it was absolutely invaluable to be able to read them to understand who Doc Maynard was, what his role was in settling this area, and also just uncovering so much knowledge about how Euro-Americans in general were interacting with the Duwamish people at the time. The letters very specifically are largely from David to his son, Henry. 
though there's also some letters from his second wife, Catherine, to other members of their family as well. I learned so much about Doc Maynard it, as a person and the history of our area through his perspective. It's one thing to know, uh, for example, on a very factual basis that Doc Maynard really regretted his decision to leave his children in the Midwest and move out here. This is actually a really widely known fact when his letters were discovered, but it's really a whole other experience to read the letters that he wrote specifically to his son, Henry, begging him to also come West and trying to set up his future, especially with the knowledge that Henry and his sister Frances never left the Midwest and never came here. So as I'm sure you can imagine, there was a lot to discover in the Maynard letters, and I'm still not completely done sorting through them and parsing out all of the information and everything that he had to say. But here are some of the key aspects that I found really, really interesting from the Maynard letters that I'm going to dive into here in a second. So the first is that the Maynard letters really shed light on his role in the Battle of Seattle in 1856 and offered his first person perspective on his feelings as the Indian agent, which at the time was a political position and was very much a liaison between um, the Duwamish and Suquamish tribes and other tribes in the region and the territorial government. The letters also really showcase Maynard's feelings toward the land itself which is a theme that features really heavily in the Longhouse's iteration of the exhibit, and the ownership he feels over the Alki Point area pretty much immediately after he arrives here in 1852 through the rest of his life and the rest of the letters that he has. And then they also answered questions that historians had regarding why Maynard ended up selling his Pioneer Square property to Charles Terry in exchange for Terry's land on Alki. That specifically has been a little bit of a conundrum for a while. Um, the Pioneer Square land is thought now to objectively have been worth more, um, been more profitable. And there's been some speculation that Charles Terry might have swindled Doc Maynard in some way. To be honest with you, Doc Maynard was also a raging alcoholic. And so there was some uh, thought that he might have been taken advantage of while he was particularly intoxicated lots of different ideas about it. But what the Maynard letters show is that Doc Maynard really wanted that land on Alki. He thought it was the most promising way to get his son out here by having lots of viable farmland. Um, so he willingly gave up that Pioneer Square land to Charles in exchange for what to him had more sentimental fam familial value. Having said all of this, though, I think that really the most interesting piece of the Maynard letters is up on the screen right now. In a letter dated March 30th, 1856, David wrote to Henry to describe his experiences during what we now think of as that Battle of Seattle. I mentioned a little earlier that Maynard played a really large role in how that battle turned out. And at the very least, he specifically thought that he played a very large role in how that battle turned out. At the time that this letter was written, he had just resigned from that political appointment as Indian agent for the territory of Washington. And he describes to, hit, uh, to Henry that the governor at the time, one infamous Isaac Stevens, actually rejoiced to receive his letter of resignation. Um, it was known by historians that Stevens felt that Maynard was much too lenient and too kind, frankly, to the indigenous peoples of the area. And that Maynard's role as Indian agent um, really did not go the way that Isaac Stevens had intended the role to go. What was especially interesting about the letter, though, was how clear it was that the actions of Doc Maynard, it, from his perspective, had such a marked effect on the conflict. Mm -hmm. He says, notwithstanding the uncomfortable position I have occupied for the last five or six months, I feel amply paid when I witness the expression of the public to this effect that although I have occupied the most dangerous post of any in this field, I have succeeded in quelling the spirit of war and established a friendly feeling and the determination to remain so with over 700 Indians, which number if added to the hostiles in the field would long ere this have cleared this country of pale faces. Whether that's true or not, whether Maynard actually convinced, uh, whether his convincing actually managed to change the entire tide of the battle is kind of unclear today. But I think it's pretty clear from this quote and others like it that he felt like he really played a pivotal role here. And to be clear as well, 
The 700 Native American individuals he references in this quote were members of the Duwamish and Suquamish tribes specifically. He had a personal relationship with Chief uh, Seattle and uh, Chief Seattle had a large role in sort of convincing other members of those two nations into laying down, uh, how does he say it, quelling the spirit of war in themselves and moving to what I believe is uh, Bainbridge Island to sort of wait out that time period. Uh, as a little bit of an aside, one of the reasons that the Maynard letters specifically are so valuable is because they're letters specifically. They weren't necessarily meant to withstand the test of time. They weren't written with the thought that people hundreds of years later would be analyzing them. They were a record of his thoughts and feelings and opinions that he was writing to his son, whom he missed very, very, very much. There's something real and very raw and very vulnerable about that, but there's also less self-editing involved in these kinds of materials than an autobiography, which we're going to talk about next. Because next, you have our friend Arthur Denny. I didn't have quite as many letters from Arthur Denny to read, but he wrote pretty prolifically about his journey west towards the end of his life. He wrote multiple biographical shorts and then culminated in the 1890s with Pioneer Days on Puget Sound, which is pictured here. This we read was really, really interesting. It covered everything from why Denny decided to settle here. John Lowe, David Denny, and the Terry brothers thought it would be a good uh, landing spot and a good place to build a town. To how he felt about the fact that he had shaped the creation of a city um, from a political and business perspective. Unlike the letters, the book was published. It was meant to stand in perpetuity. It probably had a decent amount of self-editing. But it was also intended to be fact-based from the way Arthur Denny saw the beginning of stage, uh, the beginning stages of settlement on Puget Sound. And that sheds light from everything on his thoughts to Doc Maynard, they were not friends, to his to the bone beliefs about manifest destiny and the settlers' rights to be here and to have claims on this land. Mm. Pioneer Days was also especially useful because while the Boren and Lowe families were among the first to permanently settle in the area, the Lowe's actually only lived in the Seattle area for two years. And then on top of that, Carson Boren kept moving farther and farther and farther away from town until six years after he arrived, he actually ended up by himself in the woods around what's now Woodenville. So suffice it to say, there isn't quite as much primary or secondary material about the Borens or the Lowe's, uh, especially in comparison to families like the Denny's and the Maynard's. But in Denny's autobiography, we get to take another look at how John Lowe and Carson Boren played into Seattle's history. One of the things that I learned is that Carson Boren was really well and truly a recluse. He had no desire to be anything like a city builder. He just wanted to come here, live in the woods, and be left alone genuinely. That was his motivation. But Regardless of those motivations, his arrival here at the time that he arrived is enough to tie him forever with the settlement of this area. So I'm going to leave you all today with some real nuts and bolts exhibit development stuff. So I hope you find it interesting to get a little bit of the behind the scenes of what a museum curator does all day. Uh, here's a little bit of a taste. Oh, I see a question. Yes. Um, you didn't mention that... Uh, Maynard was given one of Seattle's daughters, Betsy, to be a wife mm -hmm. and then turned her out a number of years later. Yeah, that's true. That 100% happened. Um, it was extremely distressing. Uh, he it, it was essentially given Betsy as a gift to be his, at this point, she would have been his third wife. Uh, at the time, Betsy was also still a child, which was extremely distressing. She was um, in her teens at that point. Um, and Chief Seattle had sort of offered her up as a wife because that was one of the ways in which um, they had decided to sort of make that friendship official um, and make their sort of agreement between themselves official. That's one of those pieces of history that's really hard to interpret because it was frankly extremely heinous on all parties to think about the idea of, of the, a giving of a teenage girl as a wife and then having her be kind of unceremoniously uh, thrown out of the house later um, and not 
uh, in good circumstances. And then on the other hand of that as well, that's also one of the pieces of evidence that is often used to show that a relationship between Chief Seal, Chief Seattle and David Maynard was probably kind of legitimate. That was a huge sign of respect on Chief Seattle's part that uh, Doc Maynard had later sort of thrown away. Um, that didn't end up in the exhibit, to be perfectly honest with you, even though it's a real and extremely important part of Seattle history. And I went back and forth a lot about whether or not it would be included. I decided eventually that I wasn't going to include it because I wanted to really focus on David Maynard's effects on Seattle kind of at large, as he was one of the only people who really came here with the idea that he was going to build a city and he was going to leave a mark. Um, but I weighed that decision a lot really, really heavily because that's one of those pieces of history that's really hard to grapple with and deal with. So thank you so much for bringing it up. Um, yeah, it's really, it's really just gross all over the place. <laughs> gross. I don't have a better word to describe it, uh, but it's, it's terrible. So I like, I like the alternate history. I like, I like what you're doing with this. Yeah. <laughs> it's not necessarily meant to be an alternate history, so to speak, so much as Frankly, I only had so much space on the walls at the museum. And at the end of the day, I had to make some choices about what the interpretive direction of the exhibit was going to be. Um, and that often in any exhibit requires some editing. So I think that the most important part from my perspective was to be able to say, I made X decision because of Y. And I think that people can really feel free to disagree with me about that, especially with such an important piece of history that sheds so much information on Doc Maynard's character. But, um, that was what I was thinking and, and how I felt about it at the time. Oh, yeah. No, I was just I was just saying I was enjoying the word gross. That's all I was saying. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> I'm tuning back out. Sorry. No problem. Um, where were we? Oh, we were talking about some of those nuts and bolts exhibit aspects. So um, uh, as I mentioned way, way back at the beginning here, Collaborative exhibits are actually a pretty new thing in, in the museum world. They don't happen very often, especially collaborative exhibits that happen at two different physical locations. So that was a really big challenge that we had to think about. So actually, one of the things that we spent the most time collaborating on was our marketing materials to show our joint work. We were really lucky because Daniel Niefert was a graphic designer in the area who volunteered initially with the Duwamish Longhouse to help us create our collective imagery and really try and make the exhibit feel cohesive no matter which part of the exhibit that you were at. I don't typically spend quite as much time as I did during this exhibit thinking about the visuals of the exhibit, what it's going to look like, what it's going to feel like, how we make everything feel like it's cohesively tying together. So for me, that was a really interesting um, approach that we got to take here. And we also thought it was really important that there be shared collections items that tied the two exhibits together. So we have a Maynard letter that's on display constantly at the Log House Museum. It's that Maynard letter that I shared earlier from March 30th, 1856, where he dives into his whole experience with the Battle of Seattle. Um, as you can see from the images here, some of the Maynard letters are kind of hard to work with. The one on the right has a newspaper that's been imprint and onto it. So stabilizing these letters was a really crucial uh, step that we had to take. And then additionally, on top of that, uh, we have two cedar hats on loan from the Longhouse at, at our physical location that are used in Duwamish dances. And we picked those specifically because we really wanted to tie together the women's story here, the settler woman's stories with the indigenous woman's story. Um, fashion and access to fashion for a lot of the settler women was actually a huge sticking point about moving here because they wanted to feel connected to their culture and their what they had been used to and what they were growing up with. But a lot of the times that meant that they were continually using uh, especially headwear that was not well suited for the Seattle climate and the Seattle weather. So there was quite a bit of dissonance there that I wanted to highlight by bringing those hats specifically into the uh, Log House Museum. And then, of course, there's always logistical considerations, right? So I'll go through this kind of quickly because I don't want to bore you all too much. But the hardest part, frankly, was the fact that Heidi and I, the, the curator at the Long House, met for the first time in person nine days before the exhibit opened. 
This was created entirely via a Zoom collaboration. Um, we couldn't visualize each other's spaces. We couldn't look at collections items together. And we had to do a lot of our philosophizing and back and forth via Zoom, which as you're probably well aware of right now, is not always the most inspiring of places to have a deep and creative workplace conversation. So that was a really interesting experience in all of this as well. And frankly, we were also working under a little bit of a time crunch. As I mentioned way back at the beginning, the Longhouse approached us with this idea of revisiting Spirit Returns in 2019. And work started on their end in earnest in 2019, but the Historical Society wasn't able to really put the pedal to the metal, so to speak, until November of 2020 because of namely the pandemic. That also happens to be when I came on board and started leading this project. Initially, we had op hoped to open in August of 2021, but that was pretty quickly pushed back to October of this year. And for a little bit of context, an exhibit usually takes significantly longer than a year to develop. I'm currently working on exhibits that aren't going to be opened until 2025. So all of this goes to show that it was a really, really fast, intense, creative process. But I hope it also goes to show that museums can be flexible. We have such a reputation for being slow moving, always behind the times. And it doesn't always have to be that way. We can be quick, we can be nimble, and we can, I think, really speak up for justice like we're trying to do with the Spirit Returns 2.0 exhibit. And I think as well, this also goes to show that a dual hosted exhibit is not just a possibility between ourselves and the Duwamish Longhouse and Cultural Center, but between all kinds of organizations in which we can let um, people tell their own stories and also still have a really deep connection with them. That is all from me today, this afternoon. Thank you all so very much for coming. I'm going to stop sharing my screen right now, but I am sticking around for questions or, you know, just conversation and chatting. If you would like to talk. <laughs> well, I'm so glad you mentioned that the giving of daughters was gross because in every history book I've read, it's just you know, commonplace, like, oh, wasn't this swell? This is how they solved their conflicts. And I'm thinking, swell for who? And did anybody ever protest this? Or was it just impossible? Yeah, you know, that's a really great question. I don't actually know if at the time anybody was protesting it, but I think it's really important. I mean, to me, all of this goes to show that it's really important that today there are historians of so many backgrounds who are coming together know. to look at and reinterpret this uh this history because as a woman myself all i can do is look at that and go oh my gosh i can't imagine right. being in that situation personally that is so heinous and disgusting to think about um yeah and plus what i've read before doesn't even say that i mean it already had a wife with him or two wives apparently not with him yes so the, was that so yeah, so the Maynard situation with the wives, I'll dive into that quickly. It was a bit of a mess. So when Doc Maynard left the Midwest, um, he was married to a woman named Lydia. He had two children with her, Fran Francis and Henry. They're the children that he's constantly begging to, you know, come out to Seattle. They never do. On the road, he got divorced, essentially, slash just kind of abandoned them. This was actually one of the most common motivations for people to move west at the time was that they were unhappy in their family situation uh, and that they wanted to leave them behind. And I say people, frankly, I, I do mostly mean white men at this time who were really the only people who had the agency to make a decision like that. On his way, he met Catherine. And when they arrived in Washington, they started living together as man and wife. When they moved to Seattle, uh, Maynard officially filed for divorce from Lydia and wanted to marry Catherine. That was actually only really allowed because the town judge at the time was sort of under the impression that Lydia had passed away and that Doc Maynard just hadn't filed the paperwork. So that was how that happened. And then Catherine was who he was with for the rest of his life and she outlived him. Um, but they were married at the time that the whole situation with Betsy happened. And so did she have anything to say about this woman coming in as a second wife? You know, I'm sure she did, but I, it wasn't in the, any of the letters that I had seen. And I don't actually know a ton about it off the top of my head, but that's a really good research question. I should see what I can find. Yeah. I don't know if anybody else has any other questions, but thank you all so very much for being here. Uh, I love doing these programs for Hearthstone. So I, I hope that you had 
maybe not a good time. This isn't really the kind of experience you enjoy, but an informative time. Oh, no, it was very informative. Thank you. I'm I'm totally uh, impressed with how much you know. No, I, I Sandra Joe has a question. Yeah, I want to know uh, what uh, help are you given giving the Duwamish group for their uh, getting their land, getting their reservation, getting recognized. Yeah, that's a really, really great question. So we've been partners with them with their work on federal recognition for the last 20 years. Um, but on that work, we often do what we're asked there, which is frankly, at this point, mostly sharing petitions, sharing information, um, sharing resources like um, real rent uh, Duwamish so that other non-native settlers in this area know about ways that they can support the Duwamish. Um, and that's mostly our role at this point, that and creating the spirit returns so that even more people can can know about the history and what's happening. Mm -hmm. Well, we are real renters. Why don't you quickly talk about that for a second? Yeah, so Real Rent Seattle is a, a, a program that the Duwamish tribe run where non-native settlers here can donate uh, any amount of money to the tribe every single month, essentially, because we live on their stolen land. So the whole concept is essentially that we all pay rent to the Duwamish to live on, utilize, work on their land. I pay rent myself as an individual, um, because even though I live up in Snohomish County on Tulalip land, um, I, of course, work on Duwamish land. So that's the the concept behind uh, Real Rent Seattle. And you can find out more on the Longhouse's website. Uh -huh. And they really appreciate the renters, the Duwamish tribe. Does. Yeah, we went to their annual meeting uh, by Zoom and yeah. they were thrilled. They finally have money to do some of these things because of the, because real, of the real renters. Yeah, because they don't get anything from the government. Yeah, it's one of the... Um, it's actually one of the reasons why we talked so long about kind of that last celebratory aspect of that exhibit was because so much has changed in the last 20 years and there has been such a, a huge outpouring of community support. But then, of course, simultaneously, that work isn't done, right? The, they aren't a federally recognized tribe at the moment. Um, they really want that to happen because that's the only way that they're going to be able to get some of their land back in the current structuring of our society, get their, you know, fishing and land rights back and things like that. I don't want to talk too much about that, though, just because I, I would never want to speak for the tribes themselves as as a white person. Um, but they have tons and tons and tons of information on their website. So I highly recommend going and checking that out. Yeah. And becoming a real renter. And becoming a real renter. I can co-sign. Great program. <laughs> Any well, other thank questions? Thank you all so very much. <clears throat> you. Yes, thank you so much. Well done, Maggie, as oh, always. Nice. I appreciate it so much. This has been such a nice end to the week, really. It's a wonderful presentation. And I can't wait to hear from people who watch it on our TV channel and on our YouTube channel. And I'll get the link to you as soon as it's, as soon as it's done cooking. Fabulous. Sounds good. I'd love to hear what people say, but only the nice things. I'm, I'm feeling fragile <laughs> right now. <laughs> right. And thank you, All Alan. Right. For, thank you, Alan, for finding this and doing it. Yeah. Oh, very please. good. Of course, of course. All right. Have a wonderful uh, rest of the day and weekend, everybody. Yes. Bye, everybody.